I remember very clearly the first time I saw you play court. Um, it was in in Toronto. I get. I think it might have been at one of the U eighteen, the provincial U eighteen uh, tryouts. Um, can't remember the name of the rink, but you know, uh, just for everybody else, like Courtney was a, a terrific player, um, a forward for the most part. I think uh, through your younger years, right, Court, and then uh, like myself, uh, uh, I was the same. Uh, converted to defense at some point, and uh, you know, Courtney was uh, an elite really elite level forward, uh, very, very skilled and uh, made the transition defense. And we'll get you to talk about that maybe a little bit, Court, uh, that, that experience, how it happened and what you liked or didn't like about it and how it, how it came about. But uh, uh, so I was at University of Vermont my first year and, and got to see Courtney play, was really, really, really impressed with her skill level. She went to the wrong school, but you know, we won't hold that against her. So I had I had the uh, distinct um, pain of watching Courtney from across the bench uh, destroying my team on a number of occasions at University of Vermont. But she's uh, she's since moved into the coaching ranks and uh, she won a gold medal for Canada at the World Championship uh, as a player and she's won a couple as a uh, coach for the U18 team, one as an assistant, one as a head coach. Uh, she's now assistant coach, uh, assistant or associate head. I'm not sure, Court. Assistant. Okay. Uh, her head coach, I had the pleasure of working with uh, at Hockey Canada camps as well, uh, Kara uh, Gardner Mori or Mori Gardner, whatever. Um, and they uh, together won the first ever uh, ECAC championship for Princeton a few years ago. Uh, they've done a terrific job bringing that program to the, the top level in uh, the NCAA. And the uh, main reason, like, I was really interested. I saw uh, a few of the games at their U18 World Championship in January and immediately thought that it would be great to get Courtney to come on and just talk about her experience as a coach and, and in particular at that event where she had the distinction of being part of the first all-female staff at uh, Hockey Canada, which is a terrific uh, little historic honour. And um, it's a really pleasure to coach. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I think at two, 2015 Worlds, which didn't go our way, Court, but um, the way we want it. Anyway, I'll just turn it over to you, Court, and add anything else you want, and then just maybe start with your experience at U18 Worlds this year, uh, You know how it went for you, maybe some lessons or takeaways, and I also had the pleasure of coaching um, or working with at different points, both Tara and Steph, your assistant coaches uh, at Worlds there, uh, and both of them at Hockey Canada camps as well. So so welcome, and really thanks for uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to come on, uh, Court. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for, for having me. Um, I know like when I click the link and you can see the participants that are that are kind of in this group it's a pretty incredible group to be able to chat with um and you know hopefully jump on and, and hear other people speak as well um but yeah the under 18 experience it was incredible um S S steph McHugh, um the one of the assistants and tara watchorn what was really cool was that we've all played together on Team Canada before. So we kind of shared that connection right off the hop, which was really great to be able to share that with the girls, obviously coming into camps and just knowing how stressful it is and what they're feeling and what they're thinking and all the, the kind of dark thoughts that come with, you know, the, the pressure of playing for Team Canada. So I think that was, that was pretty special to be able to stand alongside those two young women. And um, obviously, as you mentioned, the first uh, all-female staff, um, so it was, it was a really great experience. I learned so much. I had so much fun and I, I can't wait to do it again. Awesome. Um, do you want me to, what, how do, how do you want me to sure this? Yeah. Well, uh, in, in any way you like, uh, one, one of the things in particular I'm more, uh, wondering about is, um, you know, things really went your way and, and if any, if any of the other guys, uh, people don't, aren't aware, like the gold medal game was, uh, um, you know, Sweden had a great run through the tournament and as they did at Worlds this year at the world level, um, really great for their program to kind of be reviving itself. Like 
like what are some of the things going through your head as a head coach when the game really starts to run away from Sweden, like for people that don't know, uh, court, uh, Canada scored a, uh, five goals in about a six, six and a half minute span in the first period, uh, sort of against the odds. The, the Swedish goalie stood on her head the day before, and I think that was probably a factor. She was absolutely tremendous when they beat the U.S. in the semifinal game. And then it kind of pulled herself in that game. What are some of the things going through your head as a as a head coach uh, when the game gets to that point? It's five nothing uh, late in the first period. Yeah, I think you know my initial thought is, holy cow, what is what is happening here? Like, is this real life? Like, are we up five zero? And obviously, you're not saying any of this. You're just kind of thinking it. Like, you can't believe that you know, your team has come out of the gate and just absolutely put it to the Swedes, um, which was incredible to see. Um, and then it's just like, all right, there's tons of hockey left. So we can't get too cocky here. We can't get complacent. We can't sit back. We have to keep our foot on the gas. How do, how do you keep the girls motivated? How do you keep them, you know, realizing that there's still, you know, 50 minutes of hockey left, which is a long, long time. You know, you, you just – it can turn around real quick, whether you, we were obviously we're running into penalty trouble all, all tournament. So if we start doing that, the Swedes had a great power play. So we just, we could not take our foot off the gas. I think that was the biggest thing. Yeah. And, and anything in, in particular that you, Steph and Tara sort of talked about or, or the uh, way you approached it, like sort of in the, that first intermission must've been a kind of like you're saying kind of like a, whoa, a wow experience like uh what do we want to focus on here going out for the second period yeah definitely i think you know throughout the tournament we talked about these six habits um and just sticking to that that was our game plan that's what was going to make us successful um and like so the six were shots with screens triangle plays stick lifts pressure to contact boxing out and second quick and that was our emphasis from august all the way through the world championships that was the game we were going to play and that's how we were going to reward ourselves if we stuck to these six habits that was going to allow us to be successful so i think just bringing us back to day one hey what are our habits you know how are we going to leave the ice in a better place with these habits and continue down this you know I guess, fantastic run that we were on. So just maybe maybe uh, walk, through the, walk through those habits, talk a little bit about them and uh, like why, why you maybe chose to focus on them and maybe yeah. one or two other things that you, you know, like as a coach, you know, you want to keep it simple, which, yeah. uh, you know, six habits is, is sort of a short, simple list. People can keep in, the players can keep in your heads, but maybe talk a little bit about those habits and and why the three of you as a, as a staff thought they were uh, really important for you. Yeah, absolutely. So there there's three offensive and three def defensive. So I think from an offensive standpoint, you know, shots with screens, the the goalies, you know, the Finnish goalie, the Swede goalie, they gave us a run for our money. Like we had, you know, 40, 50 shots on net. And so we have to get in front of those goalies eyes. Mm -hmm. So that was a big thing, like getting in front of their eyes, making sure they can't see that puck. Uh, triangle play is just how, how can you create two on ones all over the ice? You know, these players are so skilled individually and a lot of them like to turn everything into a one on one. So how are we creating two V ones against the other team all over the ice? Um, the next one was stick lifts. And this was a big one from Troy Ryan that he implemented with the Olympic team, you know, such a simple habit. And you think, that everyone's just doing it. But when you emphasize, you know, you're back checking hard, you're lifting sticks, you're turning pucks over, and now we're going on offense. Um, just, you know, to see it at the Olympic level and to see that Troy Ryan really harped on that, I think like that was a, we need to, we need to harp on that as well. Such a simple thing, but when you emphasize it, it becomes something that, you know, everyone's cheering for on the bench when there's a stick lift and you're just getting that energy out of everyone on the bench. Um, pressure to contact. This was a big one. So F1 pressure to contact or you're in the D zone. Just we wanted other teams to be scared to go retrieve pucks, to go in the corners with us. We wanted to play physical, you know, take the body, pick up the loose puck. Um, so that was a big one. And, and kind of, you know, 
maybe at the end of the day could have hurt us because we did we did run into a lot of of penalties. Um, but I think we wanted the other team to be scared of us. We wanted them to be scared every time they went back to get pucks. Um, and then our next one was boxing out. So similar to shots of screens, you know, now we're in the defensive side of the game, getting people out of the way of our goalie. How are we box- boxing out? Are we, you know, fronting, blocking shots, picking up sticks, uh, making sure we're clearing that area so our goalies can can be successful. And then second quick, you know, that that goes right into the pressure to contact. If we're pressuring to contact, our second layer needs to be there to pick up that puck. We got to be anticipating that play, uh, ready to break that puck out. Um, and so I think, you know, those six things, like you said, very simple, but I think at this age, if you give them simple tangibles that they can focus on, it's going to help complete their game at the end of the day. Yeah. And, um, so what, one of the things, uh, that sort of come up in the last 10, 12, 15 years in hockey is like, as a player, I, I was in a defenseman eventually, I was really, really focused on boxing out and tying up sticks in front of the net. And uh, I don't know when it was 10, 12 years ago, people started talking, even at Hockey Canada, I remember having the discussion with Mel. It might have been as far back as Torino, I don't know. But the, the whole fronting thing. And for me, uh, I didn't really understand that concept that well, like why you would want to leave somebody behind you uh, where if the puck did get through and there was a rebound, um, A, they could probably get to the puck first. And the second part of it for me was, because when I was with the, the Danish uh, women's team, one of the things we really focused on with our D was, uh, was tying up sticks for the goalie in front of the net under it to control the stick, over it, whatever it is, to deny tips and rebounds. And if you're fronting someone, you really can't do that. So you're leaving that that offensive player's stick free to tip and redirect and get to rebound. So talk a little bit about that, uh, that sort of controversy boxing out versus fronting from your perspective, maybe as a coach and then as as a defenseman yourself and your your later years playing. Yeah, I think fronting kind of came into the game, I think just like kind of toward the end of my career. And I remember being a D being like, what do I got to block this shot when we have a goalie? Like, you know, I should be boxing out, looking up six, just like you're saying. Um, So I'm still a little bit indifferent on which one I like better. I think that if you're going to front the puck, you got to be able to block that shot. Like it's a skill. You have to be good at it. Otherwise, like you're saying, you know, it's going to get through and now you're out of position. Now you're not picking up a stick and the players behind you wide open for that rebound. Um, so I, I think from a fronting standpoint, like you have to be, you, you have to be willing to block the shot. You have to be willing to sacrifice. And I think, you know, if you don't have a group that's going to, you know, be all in on that, then I think you got to stick to the boxing out. I do really like the lifting up the stick. I think that um, within the women's game, you know, the goalies are good enough. They're big enough. They're getting out to the top of the crease to, to save that initial shot. And I think a lot of goals in women's hockey come from that rebound. So I do like the boxing out, lifting up the stick, um, a little bit more, but you know, I, I see it even in the NHL, like they're the, these D are fronting the puck, they're blocking shots all over. So I think if you, you know, either or can be successful, but you have to be committed to blocking that shot if you're going to be fronting. Yeah, ab- absolutely. And, uh, you know, I, I just, uh, as I said, I, I, you know, there's, there, there might be a situation for me where, you know, if you get, if somebody gets in that front first and you're getting there late or it's a big, a big huge player that, you know, you get tangled up, you're going to lose the battle to like Courtney, she was a big, strong player and, you had a little D trying to tie her up. Maybe you're not going to be successful. But uh, I really feel like, much like your offensive um, key to to create screens and take the goalie's eyes away, if, if you have, in most teams, especially in, well, all teams, not just female game, almost all teams focus on that offensively. Like get to net front, make it tough for the goalie, take the goalie's eyes away. If you flip that on the side, so if you're defending, you don't want to let teams do that. 
So that's where the boxing out comes in. Try to get body position um, early when you're coming back to the net or whatever it is. But I think it's a really, really critical and important skill for defense uh, people to uh, develop where they get and get themselves in position to lift a stick or tie up a stick over top to help the goalie see the puck number one and then deny the tip and the rebound, which are always dangerous, as we know. Um, so talk a little bit about uh, sort of the tournament itself and, and were there any points where you felt sort of some stress challenges? There were some obviously some pretty close games and just talk a little bit about the tournament itself, how it evolved and were there any sort of crisis points for you yeah. and the staff and the team? Yeah, so I think it was, um, I mean, a good thing, and obviously you never want to lose, but heading into the tournament, our exhibition game, we actually had lost to the Finns. So I think that was a great wake-up call for our players. You know, we had played them in the summer and kind of just walked all over them. And so their mentality heading into that game obviously wasn't in the right place, and we lost, which was, you know, good heading into the tournament. Like I said, I think it was a little bit of a wake-up call. Um, and then we ended up facing them again right away, first game. Um, and again, I think, you know, one of the biggest struggles we had was just we took so many penalties. And um, I actually was talking with Perry Pern, and I was he was just like, you, got, you can't take that many penalties. It's going to cost you. And I was like, oh, I know, Perry. Like, <laughs> But he was just like, you know, if you have, if you have possession of the puck, then you're not taking these penalties. So obviously you're not possessing the puck enough. And I was like, that's, that's a great point and very valid, you know, an easy way to, instead of, you know, yelling at their, you know, yelling at the players that we can't take penalties. Well, how, how can we be different? And that's, you know, possess the puck. If we're possessing the puck, then we're not taking these extra penalties. Um, so I think that was a, a big area of focus throughout the tournament. But, you know, the Finns gave us a pretty good game. Um, and then we, we faced the Americans, which we, we obviously know is going to be a hard-fought battle. Um, we came out to play another physical game. We weren't in the box as much. So I think that really worked to our benefit. And then, obviously, we, we faced the Swedes. Or did we, we faced the Swedes second, actually. The Americans were third. But so against the Swedes, we ended up taking 14 penalties, which is unheard of and if we had one more penalty I would have been kicked out of the game for really? that game and the next game and I didn't even know that was a rule right so nor did I yeah so we're you know all game just and again like one of these habits is like pressure to contact like we wanted to be physical we wanted to play that physical game but we had to find that boundary line because obviously we were pushing over over that boundary line um I mean it did help us come up with a great PK Tar Watchhorn ran our PK and um so we had tons of video to go off of and make sure we sharpen that up heading heading into our U.S. game um and then like I said the American game was great it was physical it was fast you know we we ended up coming out on top which was fantastic and then we started we faced the Finns again um, and, you know, we're heading into a, a hot goalie who's done great the, the whole tournament. Um, and then again, we fall into, you know, penalty situations and it's a tie game. And, you know, we were down for most of it. We ended up tying the game. And then we're, we're into overtime and we took a too many men penalty, which obviously is the last thing you need. I think one of our D had jumped on and obviously wasn't supposed to they're young right They're they're in overtime maybe this is the biggest game they've ever played in so the emotions are high and I think the biggest thing on the bench was just you know keeping them confident keeping them calm and I think at this at that age it was it was huge and beneficial that the three of us standing behind them had been in these moments we'd played in these moments and we're just reassuring them like you know you're doing okay like you're doing well take a deep breath instead of, you know, us panicking, like, holy cow, we're, we're, we're in overtime. Now we're shorthanded again. Um, so I think managing the emotions was the biggest thing in those, in that game for sure. And I even remember for myself, like when they called that too many men, I, I was like, holy cow, what is going on? Like we need to calm down. So I kind of just like stepped off the bench and called the ref over and, and it was really just for me to take a deep breath. Like I needed to regroup, regather my thoughts. Like, and so the ref came over and I was just like, oh, too many men. All right. So we need to put someone in the box. And she was just like, yeah, like, 
but it was more just like, all right, like, let's calm down, right? Like, let's take a deep breath here. And so step back up on the bench and we go into a, to a PK and we killed it off and we ended up winning in overtime. And I think, you know, that was the trouble heading into that game was that the Americans had just lost to the Swedes right before us. So our girls are at the rink and they're watching this game. And so I think all game, they were kind of playing scared to lose. They had just seen a big upset. And at that age, I think it really, really affected them heading into that game. Their mentality was, you know, we're scared to lose, not we're going to win or we're going to do the little things and we're going to win. So I think that we definitely, you know, again, like any advice, you know, of how to handle those kind of situations because they are young. And, you know, do you want to talk about how we know we're scared heading into this game because of what we just saw? Or do we want to just, you know, rally the troops and, and stick to our game plan? So it was, that was a tough thing that we battled with. And obviously it showed throughout that game. Just, you know, we were scared to lose. We were scared to do what just happened to the Americans. Um, so thankfully we we won in overtime there against the Finns. And, you know, once that game was over, I just knew there was, there was no chance that we were losing the next day versus the Swedes. Like the team that we had was just incredible. So much skill. The leadership was amazing. Uh, we had seven returners that had just won a gold medal in August in Wisconsin at the the last under 18 world championships. They knew what it took to win. They were amazing leaders. You know, they stayed calm throughout. And I think leaning on them in those in those tough moments against the Finns, um, you know, helped with their confidence and their growth as leaders heading into the game versus the Swedes. And then, you know, the puck dropped versus the Swedes. And before we knew it, we were up, you know, five, nothing heading into the second period. Um, and so I think obviously that, that helps. That's a little bit of a relief, but then, you know, keeping our foot on the gas was the biggest thing. Um, but I definitely think one of our biggest struggles and bumps that we passed was watching the Americans before us. And so I'd love to like, you know, how, how would you have approached that? Or if anyone has any, any thoughts or I would love to hear. Sure, and, and if, if uh, as always, like if people have questions, uh, feel free to put put your hand up. So, you, you know, like you just mentioned, you know, that your team watches uh, Sweden upset the U.S. And uh, uh, so, was there uh, some talk or strategy be- between you, Steph, and uh, Tara about? Uh, you mentioned like, do we mention it? Do we not mention it? Do we just proceed like it didn't happen? How, how did you handle it as a staff and as a team going, going into your game against Finland? Yeah, I think our approach was all right, like not even to give recognition to it and just to focus on what we had done to this point, what has made us successful, you know, how are we going to stay out of the box? How are we going to stick to our habits? Um, so that was our approach, you know, heading in, like, let's just let's just focus on us. Right. And I think, you know, was it right? Was it wrong? Who knows if we did something else? Could it have helped? Maybe, but maybe it would have made it worse. Right. So it's kind of, you know, and they're at that age where things they they're affected by the outside world. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and sort of similarly, like you mentioned, the penalty trouble um, and you mentioned, uh, sorry, Perry, I know Perry well, but you, you mentioned Perry's helpful advice is, to not take as many penalties as you're taking. Thank you, thank you for that Perry. But, but so how uh, how did you guys uh, talk to the group about that? It was there any kind of uh, uh, you know trick or tool that you remember using or your the language you use about you know obviously it's the pink elephant thing if you you know if you talk about if you say hey don't take a penalty it's very likely somebody's going to go take a penalty because that's what they're thinking about. Do you remember uh, how you actually addressed it with the team um, specifically? Yeah, so we we did mention, you know, possessing the puck, um, not following through with our checks, but like rubbing out. Obviously, we don't play checking, so we shouldn't be out there throwing the body. But we really didn't want to pull back from how aggressive we were being because it – it does make a difference. It does help us possess the puck if we're going in there and, you know, we are bumping them off it. Like both teams are being physical. Um, And so honestly, our approach was like, all right, well, if this is how it's going to be, let's have a good PK. 
it's tough because you don't want to say, you know, we're being too physical and then now they're playing soft and now we're losing battles. And like, at the, you know, it's hard at that age. And at that time of year, they're coming from their junior hockey, which isn't as physical. It isn't as fast. And so to even get them to this point where they are playing physical, like that's, that's what we wanted. That's what we had pushed for. So I feel like we would be, you know, kind of going against what we'd been preaching the whole time is being physical. So we just kind of spent more time on PK and, and touched up in all the areas that we thought we could be better at. Okay. Go ahead, Wally. I just wanted to see if Kim McCullough was on. Yes, and, she is. And if she had any questions, uh, I think Kim's uh, had lots of experience in the female game. And Courtney, in many of our presentations before, Kim has spoken about the, the, the importance of physicality and how to teach it to kids who tend to be, you know, young girls and boys who tend to be shy. And then when they get to your level, uh, we don't know where that line is or how, how to play it. So I, I just wanted to uh, introduce Kim and if she had any questions. But Kim, the idea of physicality with the kids and then moving up to the game today on the female side, it, it still appears to be uh, something they have to deal with, uh, as it did seem to cost Canada in uh, the World Championships this year at the end of the game. So, Kim, please. Thank you. Hey, Wally. Hey, Courtney. How are you? Good. Good. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, start, I start teaching physicality, like, even with our U9 rep team. And it's funny because they, you know, we were teaching them stick lifts and hunting. Those were the words we were using with these little six, seven, and eight-year-olds. And then I started doing a warm-up before the game where, like, I, they would bump into each other like we're like literally about to go on the ice and they would just like hit each other with all their equipment on and like go and then they'd immediately go on the ice and like possess the puck because the other team was getting knocked on their butts right so it was like a power of suggestion was good obviously with the junior kids uh, having coached junior for a long time that could be a little bit more um damaging when they uh, run into each other at full tilt but I do think in general and this is my experience in minor hockey you know, the big girls are scared about taking big girl penalties. And then um, perhaps when they're at U11 and U13 age groups, maybe their coaches are messaging negatively to them that they are being too physical or too aggressive because they don't want to kill a penalty. You know, I don't know how many of you have watched U11 and U13 goalie or girls hockey, but power plays aren't exactly lethal. And quite often the penalty kill scores... Uh, more often than the power play does so I, I don't agree with that mindset with a lot of coaches but often when players are physical the coaches are speaking to them negatively about it um and and I think that mindset at a young age is can can be very uh difficult but I agree Courtney like I think you have to use the physicality to your benefit um, you certainly don't want to shy away from anything. And I, I forget what the term is, right? They use for Team Canada, the power kill idea of if you take one, you're going to maybe try to go get one when you're killing. So, uh, but I think it's, it's largely the mindset and what the coaches are saying. Like if you're, if you're playing scared or if you're telling your players, don't take penalties, as, as Tim said, you know, that suggestion of don't do that means of course, now they're going to do that. Um, but I think teaching at a really young age has been really valuable for our players. And, um, you know, the young kids can get away with a lot. Or the, sorry, the small kids can get away with a lot. Uh, so I think it's to their benefit to be more physical because sometimes they can't just possess the puck with a stick lift if the kid outweighs them by 20 pounds. So that's my two cents, Wally. Good to see you. Um, Courtney and, and Kim, back in the day... <clears throat> before you all were born, <laughs> um, Dave King had created a number of progressions related to the how-to of gaining control of the puck. Free puck race progression, stationary puck protection battles, uh, pre-contact, gaining the lane, that kind of thing. And I really think those elements are vital in the teaching part of physicality. And when I watch the guys play and some of the penalties they're taking in the NHL playoffs, uh, they're taking themselves out of the play, let alone losing ice time. So 
in terms of physicality, the degree of contact on the men's side borders on stupidity because they are trying to intimidate versus play the puck and lose D side too often. So I think the puck possession thing is bang on. I love your six habits. And one of the things that impressed me with the national program um, was preparation, the planning. And Hockey Canada and the, the staffs have done a great job at working on those little details. And it's a lot easier, actually, in short-term competition to uh, get the ducks in order and get everybody to the of the line. But uh, on a club team, behavior can tend to go south and uh, you yeah. always seem to be dealing with things repeatedly in, in, in terms of getting everybody to push in the right direction. So, um, Courtney, I, I was really curious about <clears throat> how you got into coaching to begin with, like that transition and um, h- how you sort of fell into it and what what the difference was. Yeah, so right out of um, college, I started 